Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm John Fenwick from the ACLA Committee, and I just wanted to welcome um, the early risers amongst us to the first of our Greens List breakfast brief briefings. Um, today we'll be discussing the topic of how direct briefing of the bar can increase value for your client. Um, and our facilitator <coughs> and host and um, MC today will be Michael Green. Um, he's the clerk of Green's List. Um, and I'm assured that that's equivalent to CEO or Big Kahuna um, or Chief Cat Herder. Um, <laughs> so I might introduce Michael now and he can draw out a little bit more background from our panel um, as to um, their backgrounds. And, uh, and welcome, Michael. Thanks for coming. <coughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, John, um, and welcome everybody. What we're going to do this morning, as John said, is talk about the bar and <clears throat> what the bar can hopefully do for you and your your clients. Um, and it'll be by means of a panel discussion. Um, we have on the panel two barristers, one former barrister and an in-house uh, lawyer. I say that Sarah has um, tasted, I think, all sides of the profession. Sarah Turner at the far end there. Um, the panel is made up. Peter Kellyer, <coughs> Peter is a barrister, has a significant background as in-house counsel, um, like yourselves, with the with Tabcor Holdings and Crown Casino. Um, next to and Peter is now at the bar. <coughs> excuse me. Next to Peter is Gina Faber. Faber Faber. Faber. Long A. <laughs> Faber. <laughs> Gina. <coughs> Gina is a commercial lawyer, background with Mallisons, and then with the CSIRO and. Glaxo, Smith, Klein, and Meyer. So Tabcor as well, where Peter was. And so again, um, a mixed background, like I assume most people in the room have, of being in the profession, or the private profession, and also in house. David Bailey um, is a barrister now, has been for the last ten or twelve years. For uh, prior to that, was with Freehills and KPMG Legal. And on the far end, Sarah Turner, S Sarah. Um, has a background of being in the profession. I've lost my page. One of the large firms. I forget which one. Sarah, cause, cause. cause. <laughs> uh, came to the bar and was on this list at, at the bar for <coughs> four or five years. Four. four years, Sarah, and is now general counsel of Symbian Proprietary Limited. Previously was with SMS Management and Technology. So we've deliberately tried to put together a mixture of people with different experiences to talk about their experiences of either being a barrister, briefing barristers, working in-house, etc. So welcome to our panel and thanks to our panel for also making the effort to uh, get up and be here and prepare themselves for it. The format will be, I'm going to give an overview now for maybe 10 or 15 minutes of the bar <coughs> and how the bar operates and then we'll go to the panel discussion. So, <clears throat> sorry, that's the point I want to make. Participation. Please participate um, at any time during the panel discussion, during my presentation. If you want to say something or ask a question, please do. Um, the idea of it is to be as interactive as possible. Um, it may be more difficult with all of those recalcitrants who sat up the back instead of down the front here. Possibly at the university, they all sat up the back and played up like Caesar did. So, uh, but please, if you've got things to say, please participate. We'd love you to. So the Victorian Bar and Barristers is my bit of an overview. I've talked about this plenty of times, of course, as a clerk, and the main thing I always want to do is try and demystify it, because for their own reason, and I say they because my own background is as a solicitor as well, and so I don't really feel like a barrister or a barrister's clerk. Some of our barristers have tended to want to, I think, have made their part of the profession a bit mysterious, and they therefore they use language such as um, chambers are not offices and they have lists rather than groups. And of course there is the, the dressing which comes out of the 16th century um, and which has never changed. And so it in fact is not mysterious in any way at all. I always look at barristers and the bar as simply outsourcing. And outsourcing of course is a very um, common phenomenon now in business and maybe the legal profession to its credit got the hang of it several centuries ago. And so since at least the 16th century, I might a little bit of looking up, the legal profession decided to outsource the advocacy function of being a lawyer. And that's all they are. They are outsourced experts in the way that you use experts 
or consultant, but you might bring in a consultant or an expert when you're doing a piece of work at work, barristers are the same. They're an, an, an external consultant, an external expert who you bring in to do a piece of work. This piece of work may be either advocacy or when you're coming from an in-house perspective, maybe more often, it's for some, a piece of advice. They're external experts, no more than that. <clears throat> in being experts, I guess, or in being, yes, in, in staying within one part of the of a legal a lawyer's job of advocacy, they have obtained specific or deep skills in the area because they do it all the time. <coughs> Excuse me, and they also gain a depth of knowledge in their particular areas of law because most barristers tend to. The days of generalists are pretty well gone. There'd be a handful of generalists at the bar, but the majority of people at the bar specialise in their particular areas. And therefore, in preparing for cases, in providing advices to their clients, I think barristers do gain a greater depth of knowledge in their field of expertise than most other lawyers. And so, that's what they are, that's what they do. They practice at a body called the Victorian Bar, which is similar to, I think the analogy with, with ACLA holds up, it's a professional association for the barristers, although it also has some disciplinary powers that it's... Um, have been passed on to it by the Legal Services Board. But the Victorian Bar is <clears throat> a professional association. The sorts of things it does for the barristers is it organises their professional identity insurance, it helps them with practising certificates, it provides CPD for barristers under a different hat, the hat being Barristers Chambers Limited. It provides accommodation for most barristers. Not all barristers are under Barrister Shame is limited, but probably 80 odd percent are. So it provides them with accommodation. That's what the bar does. So again, no mystery. Professional association that provides professional services to its members. No more than that. <coughs> Excuse me. Under that structure, under the, the, the overarching structure of the Victorian bar, the bar divides itself up into lists. Again, one of those words, what's a list mean? Just a group of people that come together to work together. Um, there are about a dozen lists at the bar. I think about a dozen now, maybe one, one more, one or two more than that. Um, the lists then, most of them, except for two, and I'll explain, engage a person called a clerk to provide <coughs> services to the list members. Those clerks are licensed by the bar, so I'm licensed by the bar to be a clerk and to provide services to a list. Um, that's all but two, maybe three, I forget, there's only one, one extra list now that's... Many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, probably a group of barristers got together and decided to incorporate and make their own list, and that's Barristers Clerking Services, List A. So it's an incorporated list where the barristers own the list and they employ the clerk and employ the staff in the clerk's office. When Kevin Foley died, he was <coughs> one of the Foley's of Foley's list. When Kevin died, Foley's list decided to do the same, which would be also... 17, 18 years ago, and so Foley's List is incorporated and it um, in, engages the clerk, employs the clerk in the clerk's office, and I think also what used to be Glenda McNaught's list, List G, is now made <coughs> incorporated as well. The other lists, a dozen or, or, or so, sorry, ten or so of them, are unincorporated associations with a typical unincorporated association structure or lack of structure, and they engage the clerk, in this case me, I employ the staff in the clerk's office to provide the services to the barristers. The remuneration I receive and the other clerks in the, in the non-incorporated model is 4% of the barristers' fees. Um, it's capped at a certain amount. On our list, and I think probably on most lists, it's capped at a certain amount, the 4%. Um, and out of that, <coughs> excuse me, again, I run a business. What clerks do is, again, another form of outsourcing. The core business of a barrister is to prepare cases and argue cases. Under preparation, of course, comes advice on a whole range of things, but it's basically prepare and argue. And the other functions that barristers need to run their business, because they're all sole traders, they outsource to a clerk. So it's just pure outsourcing, outsource and we provide for the barristers <coughs> the normal things that an office provides. Easy for me, maybe you speak of the private profession. 
We provide <coughs> a phone system, we provide accounts, we provide mail, all of the things that when you're sitting at your desk you need to support you and enable you to do your work of a day, a clerk provides to barristers. Not accommodation, of course, that's provided by the bar. There's another side, I always think of the business that I run, a clerking business having two sides, an administrative side, which is what I've just described, providing the back office services to barristers, and an agency side, where I am the barrister's agent to the profession. And therefore, as part of the agency side, we run seminars like we're doing this morning. We sponsor bodies like ACLA. We obviously interact with the profession. We take phone calls, we take bookings. We advise the profession on the availability of barristers, the expertise of barristers, things of that nature. A part of what we do in the agency side of the business, representing the barristers to the profession. And so, clerks get paid 4%, provide the backhouse services, and then represent the barristers to the profession, and the representing thing takes on many forms, and I guess one of the forms at our list is quite um, um, kind of a, a positive about, is in marketing our barristers, in sponsoring associations like ACLA, in trying to um, better promote barristers and better open up the bar and, and better open up um, our list to the members of the profession. Clerks do that. The final little heading here is how do barristers add value. Now, this will, I'll give my opinion, but really how barristers add value or not will be, I guess, part of what the discussion is this morning um, between all of us here in the room. As I said before, I think because of the unique experience experiences barristers have within the litigation process, they know courts, they know judges, and they know how matters are likely to run or play out in a court or in front of a judge or in front of a tribunal, and therefore the experience they gain there and the repeated experience should lead, with good barristers, to excellent strategic knowledge and the ability to provide excellent strategic advice to their clients or to their instructing solicitors. So I think depth of strategic knowledge is, is one of the value added barristers bring to the equation. <coughs> As I also said, in focusing on one area of the law in intensely preparing it for going to trial, and that is certainly part of going to court, there's, there's intense preparation. I think they do gain a greater depth of knowledge in, their, in particular fields. And I guess it's not just, um, it's, it's the repetition, the fact that if you act in an area and you regularly come across questions, um, and therefore you regularly have to prepare them and check that there have been no developments in case law since the last time you did them, and things of that nature. There's a great depth of knowledge that barristers bring to the equation. Now, I think as well as bringing that, if that's then coupled with strate good strategic instinct and feel, you've got a person that can add a, a, um, can add a fair amount of value to the solicitor, in-house counsel, client, barrister relationship. Just on that point of adding value, I remember speaking to one of our senior silks, senior commercial silks, and I said to him, what do you think barristers bring which is unique to barristers? And he said that he believes it is the ability to get to the issue very quickly. The ability to see through all of the irrelevancies and get to the relevant point with great speed and great precision. And it, it, he's, a, he's a senior silk, and. Uh, a friend of mine who was uh, in a business, uh, he had told me a story about this silk, which I didn't tell him, but he said they briefed this silk one night, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, for a 9.30 conference the next morning with about a 300-page contract. And he said they were rolled up at 9 the next morning with their solicitor and the client from um, the corporation, or the, the client which was the corporation, and he said this silk, and I see it's too hard for me to keep saying this silk, Neil Young's his name, he said, Neil, um, at 9 o'clock in the morning after receiving at 5 the previous evening, knew the contract better than they did and said to them, your issue is in, clause so and so. That's, what's got to, that's what it's about. That's what we need to deal with and respond to. And it was Neil who said to me in a previous conversation, <coughs> the value barristers bring is the ability to get to the issue 
very quickly and very precisely. Um, so they're the things that I think, in my view, barristers, how they add value. Um, we'll hear what the panel thinks and hopefully what you think as well on that proposition. The other thing I want to cover was the financial side of it and uh, just to let you know what the market is, junior commercial barristers, in fact there's a, a range of barristers who start today. Signed the bar roll last night, finished the reader's course yesterday, start today. Those people will typically start at about a rate, a rate of about 180 bucks an hour, 200 bucks an hour in the commercial world. Um, some of them of course will have been will have come here from being senior associates and partners at firms and they might have been going around at 400 bucks an hour two months ago. But as of today they'll be around 180 to 200 bucks. That's the bottom of the range for junior barristers, some of whom are in fact maybe junior barristers but are quite senior practitioners. For non-silks, commercial silks, or non-silks in the commercial world, senior juniors, they probably top out at about 500 now. Um, and that's at the very top. So you're going to range from 180, 200 now to 500. More typically, 500 is the exception. I would have thought that typically it might be more like about 440. And therefore you'll get middle juniors at 250, 300, 330. Senior juniors, 400 to 500. Silks, um, probably 660 now is the bottom. And the top... Um, there's a few silks in Melbourne and probably Sydney as well who are around 1600 bucks an hour or a bit more even in some cases. So that's, um, that's the market of what barristers charge. Um, and I'll put in one little plug for barristers here. As someone mentioned to me before, when you brief a barrister, you get the barrister, you get the, you get the barrister's time, you get the barrister's fee. There is no um, leveraging, as it's called, where there are associates solicitors, etc., in the triangle, charging. That's my plug for barristers. Now, that's what I had to say on an overview. If I've got any, if there are any questions or comments, please feel free. But if not, we might go to um, the panel. And I might start, I think, with the, the non-barristers, Gina and Sarah. Maybe, Gina, if you'd like to... Can you tell us about a case when you've briefed from an in-house or corporate perspective and what your experience has been. Sure, Michael, thank you. Um, the one that springs to mind is a, uh, one of the more recent occasions where um, at TAP Corp we uh, were in a fairly long process of transition within the gaming industry. And uh, it was a period of time, probably between around 2008 or 9 in particular, through to this year um, or late last year, where there was quite a lot of uh, new legislation to deal with um, transitional issues. For those who don't know, the background to that was that the duopoly that Tech Corp and TATS had enjoyed for some years, particularly in the gaming machine uh, business, was coming to an end. And the original licences um, didn't necessarily cover all of the transitional issues that it, that it, that it could have. Um, and so, in a lot of respects, the government was having to deal with that um, uh, at the time or, you know, uh, running up to transition. And um, so part of the legislative uh, developments uh, in that context was legislation that was focused particularly on uh, what would happen to the monitoring function. Um, again, for those who are not familiar, the, the two duopolists actually monitored their own machines in that structure. It's, it's different now. Um, ever since 16 August, there is now an independent uh, sole licensed monitor in Victoria. Um, but there was a, there was a, the, the whole issue of uh, how, the, uh, how the transition from the two uh, operators monitoring their own machines through to the independent monitor would, would actually work. So um, there was a piece of legislation that dealt particularly with uh, ensuring that uh, all the relevant information would be available to assist that transition in the monitoring space. And, and it was pretty chunky and fairly, uh, I would say, fairly unusual. And so we, we were keen to understand it uh, better and felt that uh, an independent, a more independent and objective analysis of that was something that we 
uh, you know, would be very happy to have on board. And, and whilst we had panel lawyers and so on, um, we, we really felt that a more, uh, I guess, uh, very independent uh, view from, uh, you know, specialists uh, would, would be um, very, very helpful to understand what the scope of that was and what perhaps the intent behind it and so on was. And, and so it was very, very helpful to um, uh, have, uh, we, we briefed Barristers Direct and we, um, we also had the opportunity to discuss some of, you know, the, the context, although we didn't necessarily need to have a whole huge contextual discussion around that because, again, being new legislation, we just wanted to be able to get a feel for um, what the objective view of that would be. Um, and, and that was actually quite, it was actually quite helpful. It was more of a, an awareness and preparation uh, issue. It wasn't that we necessarily, again, and because of this, we, we decided <coughs> to, re to brief direct because it wasn't necessarily something that we anticipated having to do further work around because, you know, the transition was going fairly smoothly from our perspective and so on. And it was really just uh, needing to move that work. We were extremely busy and needed to move that work into an independent realm. And, and get some support that way. And, and it worked with the outcome of what you'd hoped for? Very much so, and, and it was, we, we felt also that the overall cost of that, because it was, as I say, it was a fairly chunky piece of work, but the overall cost, I think, was ultimately less than it would have been had we uh, had you know, gone through more sort of conventional structure of, uh, um, through, that, through one of the panel, panel members, mm -hmm. who ultimately would likely have wanted to get some input from the barrister in any event. Mm -hmm. But we just felt that it was the sort of thing that very much not business as usual, and that uh, you know it would be um, very helpful to have that that type of input, and uh, yeah, so it was just a discreet, uh, important uh, specialist uh, job, really, and uh, it was it was very effective. Thank you. I should have said actually in my overview, anyone with a practicing certificate can certificate can brief a barrister. There's no um, inhibitions on that. Even, in fact, people without practicing certificates, members of the public, can brief barristers for opinion work. There's no bar on that within the bar rules that govern how the barristers practice. Um, there are prohibitions uh, on any court work apart from magistrate's court crime. There must be a solicitor involved. It, it doesn't mention VCAT. The rules there for anything at VCAT, um, anyone can brief a barrister, practicing certificate or not. Um, but advice work, even without a practicing certificate, people can brief. So it's, it's in fact, uh, the availability of barristers is greater than I think the public perception is. David, anything you'd like to add to, uh, from a barrister's perspective, your experience of being briefed by in-house counsel? Uh, yes, I, <coughs> pardon me, uh, the plain tree sees it in my throat, I'm afraid. Um, yes, I've... What I find is that I'm quite often asked to give a second opinion. Uh, a corporate client will have a contract that they've been quite comfortable with until suddenly a, a dispute arises as to the meaning of a critical clause. Now their law firm is, their, their external law firm has said it means X, and some other side says it means Y. And so they'll come to me and ask me to give an <coughs> opinion. And um, one feels that I mean, I can be objective about it because I've got no previous relationship with that client and no possibly no ongoing relationship. And I can say, well, I think the clause means so and so. Now, maybe uh, it's different to what the law firm's advice was. That, that, that might create a difficulty, but uh, and that has happened precisely in a, in a very large case. Um, and as a result of which I think. Uh, um, there were some negotiations to try and resolve the matter with the uh, other side, um, and I think eventually there was some resolution. But uh, what it does point up is that sometimes the focus of a law firm, which has a continuing client, may be not always as objective as it should be. Um, and having been a partner in a big law firm before this for some years, uh, my experience was that uh, one tried to look after the favourite clients very assiduously, and sometimes I think that can lead to a, a lack of focus. Um, I'm not saying it's done deliberately, it's just, it's just the nature of what happens. You know, you, you're used to acting for a client, a big corporation, for years and years, and uh, 
And then, of course, they start to dictate at times their expectations, and, and sometimes the, uh, your objectivity can be a bit blurred. So I think that's, that's one big thing I noticed. Uh, the other, other big change to me coming from being a solicitor to being a barrister is that a barrister works backwards. In other words, what we are taught uh, from the reader's course onwards, what you learn from experience, is that you must work out where the dispute is, if you've got a dispute, where it's going to, so that how will I address the judge in final address on the theory of this case? What am I going to say to persuade the judge that we're right and the other side's wrong? Um, and I think that, and you work backwards from there, so everything you do, whether it's your advice in the first place, the drafting or setting of an affidavit, uh, drafting of pleadings, it's all directed to achieving that ultimate end of prevailing in the outcome of the dispute. And so um, it's a slightly different focus, I think, to, to how a solicitor would look at things quite often. I, I think, um, obviously, the solicitor wants to win as well, but often you don't work backwards to mm, say, well, exactly. that's where I want to get yeah. to. How do I get there? And um, what if the case against me is such? So you, you, you have to sort of look at other possibilities. So um, it is a bit of a difference of perspective, I think, that we bring uh, uh, perhaps a different objective to the equation. And uh, the other thing is that a barrister typically works on far less matters at any one time than a solicitor would. So that I might only have uh, two or three active matters at the moment. Um, and uh, so that my, I'm able to devote a lot more time worrying and thinking about that critical point. Um, and it might uh, really keep me completely <coughs> absorbed for, for weeks sometimes just to think about this issue and what are the different perspectives on it. So that you're able to perhaps just add a bit, bit more polish to a, a tricky problem. We were talking about um experiences of briefing and experiences of being briefed. I thought I might um, ask Sarah her experiences of, of briefing and of being briefed. Sarah brings both experiences to the equation. So, Sarah, anything you'd like to add to the conversation about the use of barristers, good or bad? I mean, and I, must, I should have said when I gave that uh, run out of time, I'm here to be shot down. If you disagree, please say so. Also to uh, the members of the panel. Sarah? I like to call direct briefing cutting out the middleman. Um, I find it really useful on a on a regular ad hoc basis to to brief direct. So I will go to counsel if I want a discreet question asked. It's cheaper. I can get somebody who is very senior for a much more reasonable price than I can go to one of our panel law firms if it's a discreet issue. If I want something settled, so. You know, disputes happen all the time in um, in the in-house life, and you settle them, and they never see court. Still, want people to sign a release. I might get counsel to settle a document that I've I've drafted for those purposes. Um, I might want to, as Gina said, obtain a second opinion if my panel law firm is is telling me one thing, and I'm not quite sure that I agree with their opinion. I might go and ask. Um, Council. It is easier and less threatening for the panel law firms to get a second opinion from council than it is to get the second opinion from another competing law firm. Um, and also, I find council have areas of deep specialisation that um, solicitors aren't necessarily able <coughs> to to um, to develop because they have to, as a matter of course, have a a broader. Um, practice than, than you'd have to at the bar. So I actually use counsel on a fairly regular basis. It is, though, easy for me because I have stepped on the other side of the fence, so I know who to go to. I know which barristers specialise in which areas and I have a relationship with them. And I think if I, hadn't, if I didn't have that experience, I would find it more difficult to direct brief. Michael will tell you that he's He's the guy to go to, and he's the guy who will be able to direct you to the specialty that you need. And but I think it might it, it is it is probably a hurdle for in-house counsel to get over if you're not familiar with with the bar in the first instance. Sarah, accepting you're familiar, more familiar with the bar than a lot of other people would be. That's a given, and we can discuss that issue of familiarity. Again, on the demystification issue, how do you go about it? Do you Draft a back sheet? Do you go through some particular 
formal procedure, or is it easy to pick up a phone and call? Ah, uh, pick up the phone and call. Well, that was the point I wanted to make. It's not, it's not a matter of having to um, go through some procedure any different than any than a normal business activity, which is pick up the phone, call, scan documents, I assume, and email them in. That's pretty much what I do. Yeah, yeah. I treat I treat counsel exactly the same way I treat my solicitors. Yeah, I ring them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I expect a certain speed of turnaround. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. I mean, I, I'm a great believer in that. I think solicitors up front, in-house counsel, should negotiate both fee and turnaround time when you first brief, so that those things are clear. What, what do you do about that, sir? Turnaround time. Well, I tell people what I expect up front before yeah. they get started. We, we, we have the discussion. There's no, there's no point in, 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 in miscommunication. You need to tell either, whether they're a solicitor or a barrister people exactly what you expect of them. Um, and you say, I need this back in seven days, ten days, whatever it might be. Yeah, 24 Tomorrow. hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think that one of the good things about counsel is, because it's already been said this morning, if you have, if you're briefing counsel, they tend to only be running a limited number of matters as opposed to a solicitor who may have a a greater volume of work, so it is sometimes possible to get that speed of turnaround that you might not necessarily get from your panel lawyers. And what about fee? Do you negotiate fee? Do you say, okay, well, your hourly rate's 350, we think this might take 10 hours, it's 3,500 unless you tell me different. I mean, you discuss that up front? Absolutely, but as I would with my, uh, as I would with my panel. And what about if, if in fact, fees uh, go over? If in fact it's well, I expect counsel to tell me if they're going to go over a pre-agreed sum. But yeah. again, that's no different from briefing, from, from, from getting a panel law firm to do work for you. Peter, you, you're um, like uh, Sarah, <coughs> have been on both sides of, uh, well, all sides of the fence, in fact, on both, <laughs> many. Your experiences, how do you, do you enjoy being briefed? Now, you, you've got a strong corporate background. Do you enjoy being briefed by in-house counsel, corporate counsel, as opposed to the profession? Yeah, it, I, I found, um, I suppose, firstly, we talk about counsel as being one. Um, counsel are very different in their experience, in their knowledge, their ability, their areas of strength, their areas of weakness. So, counsel are very different um, as our clients. Um, I, I've got one in particular, a large corporation that breeds me directly and regularly. Uh, and it's terrific because the communication that we have I think one of the reasons they do it is they want to be lawyers. And what I mean by that, and I'm sure we're all familiar, there are a lot of in-house teams that simply brief out, and if you like, are managers um, and brief to firms, and they don't really do the work in-house. This particular client is building up a series of precedents, and they're building up knowledge, and I've got knowledge of their business, and we've got common folders uh, in my office or chambers and uh, in their offices, and we're building up a library together, uh, and they often ring and ask me questions, of course you never charge for these things, but we're building up a relationship and a knowledge base together. Um, I think one of the hurdles that was mentioned, I know, I should say I was in the council of the TAP Corp group, so I was, when it was a top 30, top 20 public listed company, and then I moved um, to the corporate world, I was chief executive of Sky Channel, and I was head of strategy and international for TAP Corp, um, and put forward the split. Um, I would never have run, for example, Mallison's, because I didn't know anyone at Mallison, so I wouldn't ring out in blue and go, hi, can you help me with a, a joint venture agreement? Um, it helps if you know people. So for me, I knew people at Allen's, I knew people haven't been there, I knew people at Freehills. I think it's similar at the bar, it helps when you've got a relationship or you trust or you know someone, uh, and that's where particularly Michael is excellent, that uh, you might contact Michael and say, do you know someone? But nevertheless, that, that personal contact and it grows. But for me, it was a question of cost. It was much cheaper using the bar. There was a question of, um, so it was a heck of a lot cheaper using the bar. I could get someone I wanted from new in different areas. There was a question of relationship. So you form a relationship, you build a relationship, they understand your business. A question of expertise in certain areas. And a question of brand, because you can say I've got an opinion of council, particularly in government. I'm chairman of the Greyhound Racing Board. That, that, found, that seems to work very well, to say I've got an opinion of council. Opinion of silk is even better. Um, but an opinion of council seems independent rather than being a law firm. But um, from my point of view, um, it's worked really well, uh, and I think again there's that relationship. But I'm just emphasis the communication point about knowing when when something's got to be done, expectation of cost. You always exceed that. You always go below 
maybe you quote, you try and beat what the time you say it's going to be, you're always trying to exceed expectations, as you would in-house to whoever you're reporting to. But communication is everything and relationship is everything. Just to pick up on something that Peter said there, um, never feel uh, abashed about calling a clerk, myself or any clerk, this is across all clerks, and saying you'd like to have a chat with somebody who, for five minutes, barristers all the time, Peter, Sarah, when she was here, David, regularly take calls from people, have a five minute chat, and there's no charge involved because of its relationship building, as Peter said, and it is also adding value in that, in existing relationships. And therefore, if you don't know somebody, you can always ring a clerk and say to the clerk, could you recommend someone I can have a chat to, please, on a question of? And if it was me, I'd probably ask you a few more questions to clarify exactly what your issue is. And then, I guess one of the things I should have said about clerks and the values clerks had <coughs> is knowledge of people's expertise, knowledge of people's backgrounds, etc., and their availability also. But so never, if, if you want to have a chat, if you're unsure about something and it's, you haven't got anything, well, it's really, I can't spend a thousand bucks going to somebody. I just need a five minute chat to find out whether this needs to go further or whether I just stop now. And you don't know anyone, always ring a clerk. We're happy to do it because we see it as an opportunity to build relationships. Panel members, we've got anything else there we need to, uh, so I want to throw to the floor in a moment and get some more questions out of the floor. I suppose the thing, the thing you need to remember about bar is it's not just about advocacy. It's about <coughs> advice work. It's about helping you settle documents you might have done a, a, a few drafts of. And it's about cutting out that additional cost layer that law firms have with their, you know, with having to leverage and with their high overheads. Um, and it's about tapping into that, those specific areas of, of expertise. And it can sometimes involve more work as an in-house lawyer briefing counsel than just palming something off onto your panel law firm and getting them to do it for you. But I've nevertheless found the, the return of doing it myself better. And, and you learn as well. I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, in this case, I'm thinking of uh, one, not one. They've got limited experience in litigation, which is fine, absolutely fine. Because you're talking about strategically, you know, what are we going to do? They're building up expertise and knowledge themselves. So they're building up the capability of their legal department so that then the next time they can do it better or they're training their junior lawyers by, I guess, a bit like a mentor approach is what they've asked me to do. And it's, it's just fantastic. And I get a lot out of that. And I think they're getting quite a bit out of it too. Jenny, you raised the point once of CPD, we had a discussion about it. Yeah. That might be an interesting thing for people to hear about. Yes, um, Peter just mentioned the concept of training training up or informing and educating junior lawyers. I think um, in a totally different capacity, uh, on one occasion at least, perhaps a couple, I, as a supervising principal, I did engage a barrister direct to provide one-on-one -on -one CPD. And uh, whilst it was in that context, I don't see why it couldn't effectively be done in, in a particular context from a, within an in-house team or even a, a solo um, in-house practitioner. Um, the benefit of that is that you, you get, for again, if you, if you're, you, know, if you go to a, 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 very, a very good but perhaps more junior barrister, you get very good value for money. Um, and because it's one-on-one -on -one and there's a lot of learning that can take place even in one hour. Um, in a particular area that you might deem is really important and needed to avoid, you know, to keep, to make sure that everyone um, has got the the capability and education and, and awareness that they need to to um, deal with current matters and, and to develop their own ongoing um, practice. So I found that really a very good idea. Uh, it worked really well. So direct um, sessions for you know, particular, it's particularly helpful if you identify an area where perhaps there's, there's a bit of a weakness that, that is maybe it has even perhaps recurred in your mind that you think, well, we really need to get, you know, John up to speed on, in this particular area because he's dealing with a, a number of things um, for the business. And uh, I could see that working really well for a really good cost. And of course, it's, it's probably uh, a little bit superior to having a, a big group session where, you know, you might be you know, thus you ask a question and you don't get the chance and so on. So the one-on-one -on -one CPD is, is another thing that's worth thinking about. And of course you could, I mean, you know, one-on-one -on -one CPD, as well as having maybe the, the hour with somebody for 350 bucks, uh, if you wanted to, you could ask them, you could take away a paper of advice, I guess, and if you've got something to actually file or an email they can send you, where whatever you want to cover is covered, covered off and something there to uh, put in the library at work. Yeah. It's, I mean, as a clerk, you get a lot of calls. I got a call earlier this year from a 
solicitor, a senior guy, and he, I can't be that but somebody, maybe a family member or someone in the firm, <coughs> was doing a subject, it was uh, corporations law, I can't think whether it was, maybe it was in a master's even, I'm not sure, but it was something the person had never come across before, and he said, have you got a barrister who's strong on corporations law, who, in, like Gina said, who this person go and sit down with and be brought up to speed quickly? And by coincidence, we'd had somebody who had just joined the list in the last leaders' group, so uh, six months ago, who'd come from ASIC. And in talking to her when she came to the list, she said the corporations, the Act was her Bible. It sat on her desk for six years. She used it every day, all day. And so I said to the solicitor, well, I think you could probably, it could probably work. And so they paid um, this barrister a fee. I think it was two hours worth of work. And of course got what would have been a, a very concentrated and in-depth analysis of whatever they wanted in the corporation. Yeah. Yep. Interesting stuff. And that's also important to, that sort of experience is also important to the relationship building. You know, yeah. it's a, uh, it, it becomes clear who's doing what and uh, the, the ways in which a particular barrister might be able to help going forward if you have a, a substantive matter. So, yeah, so it sort of answers a couple of calls, I think. Uh, one, one thing that occurred to me recently, uh, question of conflict issues. Uh, corporation is engaged in a particular activity and uh, may be heading towards some regulatory problems. And I heard, heard a presentation by a big law firm recently about uh, bribes and corruption as that applies in uh, overseas transactions. And um, so compliance codes are being brought into large corporations. And the message was well, make sure all your employees put their hands up for this and they've got to make disclosure and so on and so forth. And I thought it was all very interesting, but sitting back as a barrister, I, I thought, hang on, but who's telling the employee of what their rights are? They may have, be putting their, their head under the chopping block for no particular reason to comply with some code, which overall is probably the, the direction of what's happening with the regulation, but their rights have to be Considered, and I think that there's a real danger in, in, in this. Um, uh, I guess this desire on the part of corporations to be good corporate citizens, that they can um, ride a bit roughshod over the, the rights of individuals who're not careful. I think we've seen a bit of this happening. Um, of course, there's a litigation over the uh, the wheat scandal with Iraq, uh, and I think it's become more prevalent uh, in the U.S. than here. But I, I gather it is. Of course, we've got. A certain bank at the moment that's got some problems about uh, about printing notes for foreign governments and things, but those sorts of issues I think have a number of facets, and and I think you can submerge them a bit in the overall need for compliance, and forget about the fact that there are individuals involved whose careers are at stake, and they may need to be separately advised, or they will need to be separately advised, and you need to have be conscious of that. I think as corporate lawyers to say, well, hang on. Um, we're giving, bringing uh, Billy Smith in to give him a bit of a work over, but uh, has anybody what told him what are right? his personal rights? And yes. possibly the bar can have a, a role to play there. It's a, a quick and simple process to go to a barrister. I mean, I, well, nothing clerks get, nothing to do with you guys in house, but uh, we get regular calls from um, particularly the OPP, Office of Public Prosecutions, saying, Have you got a barrister who can duck over the court? And this is exactly, it's a similar analogy today duck over the court and give a witness advice about their rights, about self-incrimination, before they get in the box in a criminal matter. Now, I guess it's, it's really the same point, David, isn't it? That mm -hmm. An individual person needs to be aware of their rights as opposed to their role within a corporation, mm -hmm. and maybe the bar's got a role to play there. I know John's got a question. You got that? I'll stand up. Um, Michael, I was just interested in drawing out the, um, this point of engagement issue. I've, I've never briefed the bar directly. Um, unlike Sarah, I don't know many people at the bar at all. Um, now my idea might be I'd call Sarah and ask her for a call. <laughs> 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 That's how the world goes around. So I'm sort of interested in uh, exploring the process. I'd, I'd call you and say, look, I've got a, a question about a taxation issue, a corporations law issue. Um, do you have someone at the right price for me who's available right now? And you, you might come up with one or two names. Internally, I might then have a process where I need to perhaps um, 
influence my, my manager or, or, or someone in control of the function's budget to say that, well, okay, we're, we're going a little bit outside of the, the, the square here and doing something a bit differently. Um, how do you know you're getting the right person, John, for the job? So how, do you then, do you provide some material or bio background material? That, that whatever, can whatever you want. Yeah. Um, typically, I mean, in, in a typical call, you will explain to the person, give them a, a brief um, summary of the background of the barrister concerned. Um, obviously, people nowadays, everyone goes and looks at websites and therefore you will, they'll go and look at websites. Um, and I'll say to them, look, have a look and see who you think looks suitable to you. And also, depending on who's doing the briefing, in a situation like yours where you've got to go to a CFO and justify what you're doing, yes, we provide um, CVs as well. I mean, I'm uh, just at the moment, I've you know, sent off CVs about people in the last uh, couple of days to different uh, briefing organisations. Yeah. And d does your does the Greens List website have a, a listing of the, the, the barristers on your list, which which I can window shop? Oh yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. The website has them by areas of practice. Each barrister has got a page. Some barristers have their CV linked to their page. Some have do blogs and they've got blogs linked to their page. Some of the pages have got a list of cases they've been involved in. So they vary. Typically, the higher up the tree barristers go, the less that's on the website. Yeah. I don't need to tell anyone. <laughs> um, but as people are progressing and people are developing a career and developing a practice, of course, they want to say they've been involved in these Supreme Court cases, they've been involved in these particular issues, etc. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there's a heap of window shopping can be done on our website, or on the Vic Bar website, or on the other clerk websites, yeah. And um, just maybe one more supplementary, and uh, not trying to be confronting here, but with, with the standard model for uh, going to a law firm, you, you might have a, a, a relationship manager at the a partner at the law firm who, who your relationships with and you're getting some advice in an area outside of that person's area of practice if um, you know for whatever reason there's a mismatch of expectations and you're not quite sure you've you've got the result that you're looking for um, you, you go to your relationship partner and have a you know, have a whinge to, to them what what's the process at the bar whinge to the clerk <laughs> <laughs> yes whinge to the clerk is, is, is the process um, and then depending I guess on on what's happened. I mean, my first response, I always prefer there to be direct communication solicitor barrister, be, be really from the point of view of building the relationship. The worst thing I say to barristers, you're better to talk direct with the solicitor rather than go via me because it's one more piece of contact to build that relationship. But there are certain things whereby it's better that I act as a buffer between the two because it might be a matter of fee, it might be a matter of performance, and therefore in those situations always come with the clerk use. Thanks, Can I uh, just have a comment on that? And that is that um, we're used to being in and out of jobs quite frequently, so that <clears throat> you needn't be too concerned about it. if a barrister's not coming up to scratch to, to sack them. They're used to being sacked <laughs> as well as they're used to being hired. But, um, and we're also used to being moved around to different teams. So I might work with uh, a silk on something, and um, that chops and changes a bit. Uh, I might uh, have to work with someone else or hand the brief over to someone else or I pick up someone else's brief. It's, it's a bit more flexible and uh, we, I guess we're used to, used to it happening and we don't take any particular concern about it. So it might not be quite as uh, hard as sacking a whole law firm over something. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of quick comments on the um, relationship or getting the CFO approval. Um, I, we used to brief, I used to my names, Gina Shop when she's still a junior and uh, Will Horton. And what we did was basically they gained knowledge of wagering, which no one else had. And I'd say I've probably got more knowledge of wagering than I think than anyone else because it's a tab call. And my knowledge of corporations was pretty good. Cool. Um, but they grew and knew our business very well. And it was a, a great benefit. I also designed a number of compliance programs, for example, as you'd expect. Um, and we'd have barristers come in as part of that, so the Occupational Health and Safety and Trade Practices. And the audience would see the barrister delivering the presentations, they're generally better at delivering presentations, and then when they came back to give advice, they were experts in those particular areas, and they included the in-house counsel, so the in-house counsel clearly leading it and being lawyers and 
it increased the image and reputation in those lawyers as well. So again, it was a way of exposing barristers and other lawyers to the management team. They then saw, oh, Peter, Peter's an expert in trade practices, he's answering questions. And it just gave confidence that um, there is this group, and again, confidence in the in-house lawyer or general counsel have got connections and they know all these areas and how to best find the best people. So rather than just being a managing out everything. Elizabeth, you had some comments you wanted to make. You've got some experience of uh, using the bar. Yeah, uh, yes, I have. I had um, 20 years in private practice and then went to corporate and suffered the same shock that everybody who's done that had, and that was that I had no secretary, I had no doctor's <laughs> bank, I had a chair and a computer, and I was working for a very large multinational corporation that was terrifying. So um, that was when I first started direct briefing because I had um, over 25 years experience as a lawyer and I didn't, there are a couple of things that I learned from working in private practice. The first was that I really didn't feel that there was any benefit to me in taking advice from a 50 year lawyer. Um, the second thing on some of the things that I wanted to, the second thing was despite the fact that our panel firm, had, we had a 80 year relationship with them, that in fact in some cases was uh, a negative and not a positive because they had a vested interest in proving they knew our business better than we did. Um, and they habitually pushed out deadlines um, because of the structure of the senior associate having to wait for the partner to sign off on the advice. So I direct briefed at the bar on um, three particular issues, discrete competition law advice, um, where I went to Silkener Junior um, and got excellent um, outcomes-based, sensible advice that my clients could understand, and I did that on a number of occasions. In the circumstance which David has mentioned, where we had an employee who was in a situation where the company really needed for that employee to take independent advice, I would always send them to the bar. Um, not to our panel law firm, because obviously they couldn't provide that independent advice. And on the third occasion, we did an application to VCAT for an exemption to advertise for workers over 45. And we had a, a demographic um, expert from Swinburne who brought all the material in. Um, council drafted the application, put the whole thing together. By the time we got to VCAT, they're falling over themselves to make the order. So I have an entirely positive um, experience of direct briefing. Thank you, Elizabeth. I should have actually put you up here to do the MC. <laughs> <laughs> you would have been better for us all. I, I, one of the points I should make, and I think we're just about done, where I... Oh, we've got a question at the back there, Brett. For those of, it, uh, those of us who do direct brief on a regular basis, how can we do it better? What are some of the problems we should try to avoid? But if, sorry, if you do members. direct brief regularly, please tell me what your problems are, what, what difficulties you have. I, I don't think I have any problems, but I'm here to learn if there's a way that I can do it better. I think it's actually, I, I think, look, the whole world goes around, let alone us little part of it as lawyers, goes around what Peter talked about, relationships, and therefore the better your relationships with the people that you're briefing, and even clerks, clerks play a role as well, as I can be helpful in a, in a variety of ways, the better and stronger your relationships, I think, um, the better results you'll get. Therefore, um, meeting people in whatever circumstance and in growing. Now, it might start with a clerk who would then recommend somebody to you. I would recommend, if it were me, make that first contact or conference a face-to-face -face personal conference. Things from there, there I may be by um, email and uh, even Skype and stuff like that. But I would personally make it face to face to start with so that I actually got to know the person, got a feel for the person um, and just grow a relationship. That is always the best way. If problems do occur, if there are blockages, if things aren't done in the timeliness that you have asked for or in accordance with the agreed or expected fee, John's issues, well then I think the clerk comes to play a part then. But I can't think of a much better way to make things run smoothly and to avoid problems than good relationships. And it's not just one-on-one -on -one with the barrister, it's good relationships. I mean, maybe if the barrister's got a PA, which is not that common, if they have, obviously, gatekeepers are important people. Clerks are a form of gatekeeper, I guess, they're important people. I mean, this is what the panel's got to say. Um, that's an interesting one, because uh, the pro problem I strike quite a lot is, is getting all the information I need as soon as I can get it. Um, there's a lot of sort of 
I call it creep breathing or breathing on the instalment plan now where oh, a couple more letters come in today and a few more tomorrow and, and it would be nice to get it all in one, one bunch. I know it's hard and I think it's probably it's because of the, our, our electronic communications these days, people think I, I just email it through and, and so the tendency is to be a bit lazy, I guess, and just send things through um, as and when you feel like it. Uh, I think the discipline of trying to work out now what is required here to give the uh, person I'm instructing the best view of possible and get all the information up front is, is the best, of course. And of course, um, if it looks like a matter is going to develop into litigation, you need to be aware that you're going to have to make discovery at some point or you need to be moving forward with the information. The sooner that's got together, the better, really, because um, you need Preparation is, is best done early on rather than on the, on the run as you go along. And I think that, that uh, uh, test I gave of the barrister wanting to see the end of the case, the final address to the judge, means that the more you can get at the front end, the better. I, I guess, um, I mean, the relationship, communication is everything. You get to know what barristers like, they get to know what you like. So do you want something that's fairly brief that just goes to the heart of the point, or do you need something you need to show your managing director or whatever else? In specifics, so you get something to take away. My, myself, uh, I like to see chronology on most matters. I find a chronology <laughs> really important. It helps me get a grip of everything, so I, I love a chronology. You don't often get them, but I, I find a chronology really helpful. I like to have um, documents in a folder. So sometimes you just get, well, here's the paper, and then you find, um, using David's point, you then find you get more and more paper. Then you get emails with attachments of things that come in later, and it, it gets a bit harder. Uh, but personally, I'd love, it. and this isn't always possible, sometimes things are urgent, I like to get a folder. Uh, it's great if you get instructions at the front, memorandum to council, but I don't really care too much. I'm happy to call and discussion. I like an index because it means I can get through the documents quickly. I love a chronology, which, as I said, you don't often get, but it helps me digest it all. I, I like to have a call, an idea I like face to face because you get a rapport, they get to see you in the eyes, you see them in the eyes, you can ask when do you need it, what are your expectations for cost, what do you really want it for, and often it's do you really want this, there's another way to skin the cat, so it's strategic, so it's political in particular, it might be you can discuss other options, but when you just get the brief, you don't find out what their real objectives are, so I like face to face at this time, uh, I love a chronology, index, I like organised folders, not just here's, here's the paper. I don't care about pink ribbon too much. Uh, I don't actually have back sheets and things, um, but it's nice to talk and build if, if that helps. Now, Sarah, you're in the hot seat here. What do you do? I want to know whether you are particular. Which yeah. will they have you as a client? I don't know that Sarah was very particular when she was a barrister as to what she wanted. Are you doing it, Sarah? Uh, I'm afraid I still do a chronology because I love a chronology. <laughs> so I, I like to do a, I like to do a chronology for myself so that I know what the issue is and, and what exactly it is that I'm handing over to council. Look, if it's a super discreet issue that I'm asking them about, you know, if it's a piece of advice, you don't necessarily need it in chronology. I want to know what this section of the law means or I want to know what this section of the contract means. Of course, you don't need a chronology. But in a matter where there may or may not be a dispute in future, I love the chronology anyway, so I'll have done one for myself. Does that help? Uh, yes. I hope that was helpful. <laughs> question for Sarah. I'd just like your comment please on briefing out um, when there's a, a difference of opinion say between the in-house team and the solicitor. I'd like your opinion on what that says to your client, your internal client, about the expertise of their in-house team. I can't say that I have found an issue. Um, I've got a the, the relationship between the legal team and the business is a very strong one. Um, and if I am recommending a certain course of action, even if uh, I've got a panel law firm that's saying one thing and a and a and counsel that's saying another, it's my job to make a recommend as general counsel to make a recommendation to the business about who I think is right. Um, so I haven't found it a particularly difficult hurdle to get over, but I do have a very good relationship with the business and I, you know that might not always be the case. Do you always share with the business that 
no. all of the machinations about how you get to that point anyway. Well, no, I, mean, I don't. It's not necessary. The, the business doesn't it. want to know. Yeah. They, the, the business is not interested in the minutiae yeah. of the legal advice. They want to know what they're supposed to be doing. Thank you. That, that, that last question is very clever. Yeah. I think if we're done with questions and if we're done with any... I've got one more question to you, Michael, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we talked about, you know, if there's an issue or, or, or concern uh, regarding embarrassed services, for example, speak to the clerk. I'm just wondering, is that really like, is that the first step or the second step? Well, would it be best to sort of to try to deal with it with the individual first? I'm just, I, I really am not sure what... I, I always think it is better, it better, if possible, the view of the individual. I, I always, that is always my advice to the barrister, is you speak, and I'll say to the solicitor, I'll say to the barrister, if there's a problem, I'll say to the barrister, can you deal this direct with the solicitor? If they say yes, well, it's better that you do it than me. And I'll say the same to the solicitor, when they, if they raise an issue with me, are you happy to talk to the, the barrister about it? And they say, yeah, I'm comfortable to talk to the barrister. I say, fine, you talk to the barrister. It's only if there's some... I, I see myself as the second option, not the first. Yeah. But, it, I mean, without sounding too repetitious, um, it gets back, I guess, to the relationship between the two, you know, what's going on, the context of everything, but I always see myself as the second option of the first because I'm always thinking about how does a barrister build a better relationship with the person. Yeah. Because you know, barristers' practices are no more than a series of relationships and therefore the more they've got, the stronger the relationship, the better the practice. So, yeah, it's important to the actual relationship with the barrister, I think, to, to you know, at least try to communicate yeah, well, at I, that I, level first. Yeah, Paul, I would always recommend that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming, and I think we should thank our panel for their time and the preparation. <laughs>